take two. Not seeing it yet. There we go. Do a little bit of sharing here. We are live on Facebook, so don't say anything you don't want, you know, going out to the world. Say, uh, when I do the live stuff, I tell people, uh, can we edit that? And they'll ask, but can we edit that? Can I take that thing out? And I said, you can take that out. Right now, it is passing Jupiter. Oh, yeah. So if you get in your faster-than-light ship, you're going to get out there in a few hours, and you can probably edit it before it reaches Alpha Centauri. Well, like I told you, we usually have, uh, I have people check things for uh, foot and mouth disease, so uh, <laughs> we're beyond that right now. Okay, so this is, uh, oh, where, do I even know what button to push for this? Yeah, I think I do. Uh, hey, it's live. Oh, that's me. There we go. Ham Radio Now, episode 384 from the Orlando Hamcation. It is live, and we're going to do an AMSAT update. And I am, did I put this? Yeah, there's me. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to this guy. The, you're not Gary Pierce. You are Joe Spire, K6WAO. Yes. The president of AMSAT. Yes. Uh, that, what happened you, to, that, that was a question, it sounded like. <laughs> well, because what happened to my buddy Barry, Barry Baines? So Barry Baines, after nine years, decided <laughs> to... Uh, to lay down the reins, and uh, we had a uh, election of officers at the AMSAT Symposium, and uh, I was nominated by the board of directors and elected president at the end of October in last year. Was there something like this Woo going on? Well, Barry and I actually saluted each other and <laughs> had a, uh, you know, I stand relieved ceremony uh, for that, uh, him being a naval officer, so we had to, uh, had to have a little bit in and you know a, a few exchanges of parting gifts later on but uh, I did notice that uh, Barry was a few inches taller <laughs> and uh, he smiled a whole lot more so I wasn't quite sure what I what he was smiling about but all uh, that weight lifted from your shoulders uh, yes the heavy burden of <laughs> command yes uh, so uh, let's find out what's going on with AMSAT. You guys fly satellites or something? Drones, I guess these days. <laughs> Drones? No, 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 no. We we build and uh, operate amateur radio satellites. Uh, the classic name for AMSAT is the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, or AMSAT, Amateur Satellites. Uh, that is I mean, a trademark could, name. Could be RAMSAT, right? <laughs> Not RAMSAT. No, it's AMSAT. We've trademarked that because somebody uh, way back when decided uh, they were going to do that commercially. So uh, we went through the trademark procedure. Uh, there's a number of other AMSATs around the world. Uh, they have their country designators uh, behind them. We are the original, uh, approaching almost 50 years. It will be our golden jubilee next year. Usually only do that for the queens, but I figure a satellite <laughs> is, is a jubilee. Yeah. So uh, it'll be our 50th anniversary next year uh, for AMSAT. So we're looking forward to that, and we've been uh, launching CubeSats lately is what we're going to talk about here today. Okay, I'm going to ask you um, how AMSAT got started 50 years ago. Is, is, you're, you're giving me that... That I'm not sure I want to handle that. that well, uh, no, I'm, I'm but, giving you that I just read the history of it, and I don't know if we have <laughs> enough time to go over ah, 50 years. So okay, uh, but before we do that, I'd, I want to figure out uh, where you came from. How, um, what's your little bit of your ham radio background, and how you got into the satellite deal? So uh, my background uh, is uh, I I said this in a QST article with Steve Ford that uh, basically I was a professional before I was an amateur. 
Uh, I did uh, radio uh, in the military uh, for aircraft on C-130s. So there's uh, there's nothing like uh, airborne mobile DX uh, with HF radios. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I came into the professional world, did microwave, did 900 megahertz stuff. And uh, when I uh, started uh, dating my, uh, my wife, uh, Carolyn, uh, KF6JQE, uh, we would go and visit my brother-in-law. Was she that when you started dating? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but my brother-in-law is a, uh, a family of hams, so I got to give the shout out to, to Bob, uh, K9MWM. Uh, it's all his fault. I've been blaming him ever since, uh, since then. Uh, but he was a big-time amateur radio operator, and we'd go up skiing uh, in uh, out of Glenwood Springs in Colorado, and he always had handy talkies. And to be part of the group, I needed to go get my uh, commercial licensing. And after I had comp- uh, done that with the FCC licensing, I decided, well, you know, I'll go take my amateur radio test, and that way I can just get a handy talkie and it'd be with the family. So it was a family of hams that started everything. <laughs> so what era are we talking about? What uh, uh, This was the uh, late 90s. So uh, I've been doing amateur radio uh, a little over 20 years now. And uh, probably 20 years before that, I was doing professional uh, commercial stuff uh, and uh, telemetry and that sort of things. Okay. So 20 years as a ham, that's that's pretty good. You got some yeah, history. I, I came to it late, late in life. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I have now crossed my 53rd year. So I think, you know, anybody who started in the 90s, you're a newbie. But i got to re- oh, yeah. reorient my thinking because you're not. You've been around for a while. Yeah, I, I've, I've been around for a while. I just uh, did not get the amateur ticket for a while. All right. So how would the uh, satellite, how did you start getting into satellites? Well, uh, Bob was really into satellites. And, and basically it was like a sticker on the garage that was like Phase 3D, one of the older amateur satellites. And... Uh, and he always seemed to have really cool equipment, you know, laying around and, you know, things that would point up in the air. And, uh, and I did amateur astronomy before, so uh, I, I've noticed things like that, especially if you do, you know, your, your azimuth and your elevation rotors, because that help you, helps you point telescopes uh, very nicely. So uh, I was kind of into the mechanical end of it. And then, well, what are these antennas doing? Because that's radio. So I started talking to him about it a little bit, and uh, I finally decided uh, to listen a little while and listen to uh, AO51. And uh, there was an AMSAT symposium coming up about uh, six, seven years ago out west where I live uh, in, in the Bay Area. So I went down there with the idea, well, you know, I'm an electronic guy, I'm an engineer, I'm this sort of thing. I, I can help them build satellites. Pretty much how anybody volunteers for, for AMSAT is, yeah, I'm going to help them build <laughs> satellites. And uh, Barry Baines, our, our uh, IPP, uh, that is immediate past president, uh, he d- decided that, uh, uh, gave a speech that, well, where we need is people in education. That's where we need. We don't need any more satellite building? Uh, we, we got enough guys volunteering for satellite building, and we got a good group. But uh, our immediate need is, is this, and um, I had taught uh, uh, adults uh, before. My wife was a, a teacher, and... Uh, uh, a small group of us decided we would start the, the education and work with AMSAT on that. And uh, unfortunately, with me now being president, I need a new vice president for education. So, uh, <laughs> Gary, if you're interested, you do a great job, and we'd love to have you. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, just point that out to the Ham Radio Now audience. And, uh, and your, uh, your website is, uh, where was I here? Uh, AMSAT.org. AMSAT.org, yes. Oops, I actually had that on your title, so... I'll do it that way. Amsat.org. If you want to be the new vice president for education, <laughs> contact contact send Joe. Me, at, yeah, send me an email. <laughs> that that uh, usually what it takes is I ask a few preliminary questions uh, and uh, we determine the best need for our volunteers. And you probably have one of those Amsat email addresses. So absolutely, K6WAO yeah. W A O at, at amsat.org. Amsat.org. Okay. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll find you one. What, is, what does it take for that particular job? Um, generally, uh, what happens with the, the vice president for education is they deal with uh, getting our the satellites we're working with right uh, now, what the university experiments are on them, helping with some coordinations with the universities for the experiments to sort of get an educational program out, uh, awareness, that sort of thing. 
and they get to uh, help manage uh, the amateur radio on the International Space Station program, uh, part of the education committee uh, committee for ARIS. A, a somewhat popular aspect of... Uh... Yes, uh, ARIS is a uh, what I tend to call a crown jewel for AMSAT. Uh, not only do you get to play with astronauts, uh, you get to meet them, you get to talk to them, uh, you get to help uh, anything from K through 16 communicate with astronauts on the space station. And, and uh, it, that was part of my, uh, uh, I guess, growing up with AMSAT with the education aspect was I got to help out with ARIS and uh, meet people from all over the world. And, and I've met a few astronauts, too. So if, if I were, and, and when I was initially thinking just the words, education i'm thinking teach people how to operate satellites uh that i'm off that, base that's operations <laughs> <laughs> okay so you're, you're going into the universities you are universities there. schools we we have programs and uh i will say that i when we come to hamventions like hamcation and uh when we go to hamvention in in uh, xenia now uh, we do do forums where we try to help people. Uh, we have a getting started guide. It's implementing, um, reviewing that, trying to do articles for the latest, uh, greatest stuff, make sure all the modes are covered, all the satellites are covered. So uh, it's in depth. But that's and operations, not. That's typically education. operations, but the education guys, you know, uh, uh, you, you need to be the. Uh, satellite evangelist for any of these uh, AMSAT positions and uh, so somebody asks a question about education you're able to handle it somebody asks <laughs> questions about operations you uh, need to know how to operate everybody has uh, all hats <laughs> yes I'm, I'm a man of many hats that's uh, that, that keeps my head warm uh, right, and, so, uh, so you saw that you saw the antennas and stuff and you thought this was cool how long until you had your own station how long until you made your first contact how excited were you it it, it took me uh, probably three years or more before i actually made my first contact and um it's a long incubation period yeah i i don't jump into anything uh and i got sidetracked i did uh, uh emergency communication for uh, the sheriff's office for a while and uh so I was doing search and rescue and emergency communication and mountain rescue out west. And, Did you get a ham radio component in doing that? Um, yeah, you needed your amateur radio license, and then you were a member of uh, uh, the non-sworn sheriff's office, and uh, you would uh, uh, go out on search and rescues, and you would operate and control the search with the deputies in the, in the van with you. Basically, they're making all the decisions, but the voice on the radio, you are the uh, the voice of God, as they say at the ballparks. Oh, cool. We we'll we'll need to hook you up to some more MCOM episodes, <laughs> but you're not doing that anymore. I'm not doing MCOM anymore, but I know people who are, so uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it's all in amateur radio. It determines uh, who you know sometimes. Excellent. All right, so uh, tell me about that first first contact what equipment what satellite what bands uh, and, it, and it and, was uh, and how, how how long until you could actually um i don't know stand up sit down talk to people normally uh it was um uh, for me it was ao 51 and uh what's that satellite do uh that satellite does nothing right now the well, batteries died <laughs> but it was basically so, so, a uh, so let me let me show you how much i know about the satellite stuff you're waiting for the batteries to short and have it come back on right <laughs> No, not on AO-51. That one won't happen. That happened on AO-7. And uh, typically, because that happened, all of our latest series of CubeSats, we built with that feature in mind. That was called ZombieSat. So, uh, or the zombie mode, excuse me. Yeah, so let, let, let's explain to the audience who is not really familiar with all this stuff, what that deal was with the battery dying and then the battery shorting. Why did the battery die? Because it's solar powered. Right, and and the battery is is a buffer for the night nighttime. So uh, so so why did the battery die, kill it, and why did the battery shorting let it operate again? Okay, so this is one thing I learned from from Eris, Gary. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, so uh, the uh, the thing with AO7, which is a satellite you're referring to, which was launched in 1974. It lasted to, I think it was the 80s sometime, uh, I won't say early or mid, but somewhere in that range, uh, the exact date escapes me. Um, the batteries shorted together. It happens because of radiation, of temperature changes in space, and material lifetime. What kind of batteries were they using in that era? Uh, I, the think they were, I think they were NICADs, earlier NICADs. Don't use so those anymore, I suppose. We, have been, we use the last NICADs on Fox because they, their flight 
uh, proven, they've flown before, and we know how to heat them and keep them warm so that this doesn't happen. So the, uh, the batteries on AO7, uh, over the life of them, they shorted out, and because of the way they were electrically connected to the solar panels, they were on the same bus. So everything from the solar panels, the voltage was basically going to the spacecraft frame, and it was all neutralized. Yeah, the sol solar panels made juice. They were making juice, yeah, and it was going right to the frame. Because the solar panel doesn't care if it's getting shorted out. It's nah. just, uh, it, it makes as much juice as it can. It, it's, it's making juice. It's just not being able to be used. <laughs> okay. So, so when the short opened up. So uh, the interesting thing that happened was one of the former past presidents, uh, uh, Robin Harrington over in England, in Great Britain, he decided that he would keep monitoring AO7. And along about, I believe it was 2003, he noticed that it was making sounds again and the, uh, the satellite was working. So the supposition becomes, well, why is it working now when it wasn't working then? And they calculated that basically the batteries had finally opened enough, they deteriorated enough that they opened that the uh, power from the solar panels was going to the bus of the spacecraft and back to the radios and the transponders. So uh, the, you can still work AO7 today as long as it's in the sunshine. We asked, uh, the other thing that we've noticed has happened is if people use too much power to talk to the satellite, try to boost their signal up, uh, this is all line of sight, so you don't need very much power, it overdrives the old electronics in the satellite and causes it to switch modes. This, <laughs> this one had two modes. So if you want it in a different mode, this is a secret we're telling you. Don't tell anybody well, else. Well, uh, you can make it go to the different mode, but the problem is that when it goes into the other mode, it uses more juice than the solar panels can provide, so you basically shut the satellite off. <laughs> So okay. we ask people not to use too much power. So, we call that FMing. So what mode is it in now? Uh, usually it's, uh, uh, we don't know which mode it comes up in afterwards, and we get it to try to, uh, we send the signals up to it to try to change the mode to mode A, I believe, is the one that we're using and not mode B. Uh, or I could have that reversed. I'd have to pull up my A07 <laughs> sheet to, to, to do the, that. He's the president, and he can't. So if, if this has ever been confusing to you, well, Here we got the president, and he's not really <laughs> sure. Mode A is what? Um, typically, mode A, uh, I'm going to confuse mode A's and, and mode B's without a cheat sheet. And he's sheet. the president. Well, I don't want to give the wrong answer. <laughs> this is the educator talking. So you, you want to look up uh, how to operate AO7, and that is on the AMSAT website. And since I have not operated AO7 in a while... But typically you have a UHF and a VHF mode, and you have a, uh, I believe they had a 10 meter mode on AO7, or a higher mode. And if you're pulling that up, you can find it. I see you searching over there, Gary. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to find it, but uh, you can look at, at the monitor over there, and you see what I'm looking at. What, what do I want to, I see satellite info. So satellite info, info you can have uh, current status is everything. All the satellites that are out there, communication satellites is probably it. But the best thing is to go up to the search box and search on AO7. Oh, okay. AO7. So Field statistics, day, is there is detailed description of AO7 right there. Okay, launched in 1974, similar to AO6. Well, that's good to know, I guess. Yep, so there's your mode B and mode A definitions up in the second paragraph. One more up. Okay, um, there we go. Mode A is 2 meters up and, oh, 10 meters down. 10 meters down, and mode B is the... Uh, UHF for, at 432 up. Yes. And, and 2 and meters down. 2 meters down, And yes. the mode you want it in is, is B? mode B, yes. Okay, so you don't want to talk it on 10 meters anymore. So think about if you're talking on 10 meters, you need more power. So uh, yeah. that, that drives... Uh, you can't do that with the solar panels in their current condition. Okay, you would love to be able to do that, but... Yes, you'd but, you can't, but you can't. You, but what happens is when it goes into that mode A, then uh, what happens is it draws too much power and shuts the spacecraft down, and it okay. reboots. So you got active control operators on the ground that are that check it out each time it comes into sunlight. Yes, we have uh, control operators that uh, check it out when it comes into sunlight, check the health, try to download the telemetry, just like it was a, a, a normal satellite operations. 
Is it? Um, it's not the highly elliptical satellite. It's it's just an ordinary Leo. Uh, AO7 is a little bit uh, higher elliptical orbit than uh, I think it should have the orbit thing on the on that page. I think it's a little higher than what we get out of the Leos, which is low Earth orbit out of the CubeSats. Yeah, I don't like to, to spend uh, a it, long time reading websites. <laughs> yeah, try to do just on AO7 alone. It's yeah. got a great, great history. Okay, and there's uh, there's a picture. So I can see, yep. see what it looks like. That's a pretty big satellite. It was uh, what was called a microsat. So, uh, Not a pretty big satellite. It, uh, it's uh, smaller than the, the large ones. Uh, I uh, equate the large ones to about the size of your booth here uh, at, at Hamcation is, is what a larger normal size satellite is. And that one's about the size of uh, an old TV set, if you'd uh, remember the old analog TV sets. Yeah, but it's nothing like a CubeSat. CubeSats are much smaller. They are uh, 10 centimeter, uh, a 1U, we call them units. Uh, 1U CubeSat is uh, 4 inches by 4 inches by 4 inches, or the exact standard that uh, came out of uh, uh, Cal Poly, uh, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, and weighs no more than one kilogram. The uh, CubeSats originate with amateur radio? Because I know that they're now, they're gone beyond ham radio now. So what happened was, uh, uh, Bob Twiggs uh, with Weber State University helped AMSAT, uh, AM, with AMSAT partnership, built a satellite, one of the microsats. He then developed what is called the CubeSat uh, standard, which is the U standard, so 1U, 2U, 3U. And Bob Twiggs was a longtime AMSAT member that came out of the Weber State days and is now uh, teaching there, in, I believe, up at Moorhead State in, in uh, uh, Kentucky. And uh, they, he is the designer and the uh, guy who wrote the specs for the CubeSats. And a uh, longtime AMSAT member and uh, a real, real great proponent for amateur radio in space. Am I right? CubeSats have been, uh, as a form factor, discovered by the rest of the satellite community? Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's good and bad for AMSAT. <laughs> Uh, it's great we kind of invent this technology uh, and we're able to use it and we're able to use it for amateur radio use. But what happens is the CubeSat initiatives, when they first started out, they were designed for education, to teach people project management, to teach p uh, people systems management. So the whole idea with uh, universities and, uh, and even high school and elementary schools now building CubeSats is for them to learn the process, what it takes. Uh, they do not build a satellite, or they try to build a satellite that works in orbit, but because they're doing the integration for every single component, the housekeeping unit, the power, the radio transmitter, the receiver, the antennas, the spacecraft frame, there's a lot, uh, shall we say, uh, more room for non-optimal uh, op performance, I guess. So. Uh, Failures tend to be uh, fairly high in the CubeSat community for universities. That and they have that one... That is still sitting on the ground. Uh, oh, oh, some been, of them... Some got launched and then failed. They get launched and that's the last you ever hear from them, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I, I did hear one time uh, with Leo's, it's called a self-flushing problem, is they uh, will deorbit. So uh, uh, all CubeSats and all satellites that go up have to have a deorbit plan. And if they're in the uh, lower orbits like the ISS is, it takes about six months before they deorbit um, just the, the mass and the drag. Uh, there is some drag up there at 300 kilometers, and uh, that brings them back down and, and re-enters. Okay, so that is their, their design life, not of the technology, but of the orbit. They're not, they're not planned to be up there forever and ever. Right. They're not planned to be up there forever and ever. Uh, AMSAT, like I said, we've been doing this for 50 years. Uh, we, we know about orbits. Uh, we try to go for the longer duration orbits. Uh, so yeah, the AMSAT CubeSats stay up longer. It's right. The, it's the university experiments. Well, there are university experiments that fly when we fly if we partner with NASA. Uh, it's just that uh, we've had good success and uh, the universities, while they've had successes, a lot of them are just uh, uh, beacons. Their telemetry comes down on beacons. They're not operational transponders, which is what the amateur radio community likes. Okay, uh, did, did that all of that stuff start in cooperation with AMSAT, or 
Did, did they just read a magazine article and say, oh, we can do that too? Uh, the, a lot of them, they say, oh, we can do this, and, and they go from it. Uh, there's been a few successful programs. Uh, the U.S. Naval Academy, um, uh, Bob Reninga, uh, the father of APRS, teaches at the Naval Academy there, and he has midshipmen building CubeSats and getting them launched, APRS he, satellites. He's, he's an AMSAT guy because he's got an AMSAT.org oh, yeah. email address. Yes, Bob's a, Bob's a big AMSAT guy, and uh, he's working hard to try to get another satellite launched here, I think, I believe, on the next SpaceX that actually has a harken back to the old AO7 days. It has a, uh, a transponder that uh, operates up and also a 10 meter transponder on it as well. Okay, so And he doesn't do anything that doesn't have APRS on it. <laughs> Everything you say leads me to 10 more questions. <laughs> SpaceX, okay, so that's new. And yes. what's the deal there? It, it, I mean, it, your, your uh, relationship with NASA has been good, but they, you know, they can't give you a ride every time you want one. And so now the SpaceX thing comes along, whole new negotiation. How is what's going on? Uh, so typically, how we've dealt with it is uh, uh, SpaceX is a commercial provider, so they are. So like, they want money. Uh, well, yeah, uh, you know, I, I mean, so uh, let, let's take here since we're in Orlando here, and, and since uh, I believe there was a launch of uh, a Roadster the other day. That yeah, I was uh, going to say, did they put? Did you put a little beacon on the uh, on the Tesla they sent up? Uh, I would have loved to. Uh, but uh, you have to understand the, uh, the, the the dynamics of it. If you're planning on launching your Roadster on it and you're expecting it to blow up on the pad, which is what Elon Musk said, uh, you probably don't want a lot of extra integration in it. So he they're doing their like own a, thing. Like a bullfang. It's his money. It's his money. He decided what was going on it. I, I applaud his success. <clears throat> but yes, I'd have loved to have a, a transponder on it. I say you could put it, but you know, a, a, a Waxon or a Bofang on that wouldn't have been too much money. If we would have uh, uh, been able to get in contact <laughs> with them and, and been able to do something, we would have probably got something like a, a, a Fox uh, a system on it with a solar panel that we could track and actually use for communications. We like to do radio science in space. That's what AMSAT likes to do. So uh, we tend not to try to do things that we don't think we can do. And uh, that's one of the reasons I believe for our success is we have people who've been doing this for, in some cases, you know, 20, 30, 50 years and advisors from 50 years back that tell us how they did things back then. So we have a lot of experience in it and we've had our failures, not just like any other space corporation, but uh, we tend to have a lot of successes because it, kind of know what you're doing, you kind of have success. Now you do. <laughs> yeah. So so do you have a deal with SpaceX in any way at all, or is that, is that to be... Because you're saying Bob Berninga did something with them. Uh, well, he has a, a launch that will be on the next SpaceX. So typically how the launch provider world uh, is, is they contract with NASA to provide uh, ELANA launches, which is the educational launch of nano satellites. In this, uh, NASA gives you a $300,000 grant for launch costs that you apply for. It's through the CubeSat Launch Initiative. When they do that and you apply for it, there's awards that come up and you get a chance on the next spacecraft or on a spacecraft. They don't tell you which one it is, you just get an option of orbits. Now, who are you competing against? Universities, uh, high schools, elementary schools, uh, the military, uh, they buy space on the spacecraft, so that actually takes space. Commercial operators, you name it. Every CubeSat. For the, for the grants, you're, you're going um, For the grants, the it's universities and, and nonprofits, is who, what that okay. is for. And, and that's part of why you associate yourself with a university project. Exactly. So, so we associate ourselves with the university project. We're a nonprofit that uh, works with the university. Uh, we've had great success with Vanderbilt University with their uh, radiation experiments on, uh, on uh, uh, Alpha Oscar 85 and on Alpha Oscar 91. And uh, they love us uh, because we have operators all over the world that download telemetry. Most universities, the only time they get their download is through one or two stations around a country. And so they get very, very little telemetry back. They have very, very little opportunity to command their satellite. We have operators all over the world that are dying to get that first <laughs> packet. So they get the, the first packet recognition award. So that's, that's like the DXers who want to work a new country. Your guys want to 
get a packet from a new satellite. They, they want to be the first operator of the new satellite. So uh, when we turn, uh, we just turned uh, AO92 over for amateur use here uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, that's why they're crowded. It becomes like a DX contact uh, over the 10, 12 minutes of the pass. So yeah, they're uh, they're very, very competitive. You and got, got uh, a nice certificate. Um, if it's your first satellite <laughs> contact, yeah, we have a nice certificate for that. Uh, we have their satellite uh, DXCC awards, uh, and if you like awards, Gary here. So this is <laughs> here's here's a special announcement. So next year is our 50th anniversary. We are working on a worked all presidents award for amsat so we amsat we, presidents amsat presidents okay so not, not obama trump not obama trump yeah that'd be nice but uh you know i don't don't see that happening uh we'd see, have to get them licensed first yeah, we got obama we got trump we got bush uh, <laughs> we got, we're all the way back to still, carter still a yeah. carter yeah um and that's that's it just four that's it uh, that that's it well you got two bushes still and okay, you got clinton right. and yeah uh, and clinton okay yeah so it's so so. six so, so, so six. So you're still still good, but uh, but that's not the contest. That's not the contest. So, so we got you. We got me. We have Barry Baines. I have not got a hold of Rick Hamley yet, but uh, we're trying to get him. We have Tom Clark, uh, Bill Tynan, and uh, I'm Keith Baker is another one, and Keith Baker's currently on our board. So we'll we'll do some scheduling when we get everything worked out, and uh, and of course our founding president Perry Klein there in in Washington D.C. is still around. So uh, we will uh, try to uh, get everybody on the air at some point during the year of our anniversary or all on one day. We'll make a, a nice announcement about it and we'll work up a contest for it. So something to look forward to. And it's going to be through satellites. It'll be through probably exclusively AMSAT satellites. I, I, we do have to you know, put some limits on the contest to make it harder. So there are, There's other amateur satellites that aren't under the AMSAT banner? Yes, there are. Uh, in uh, different countries? Uh, not, not different in countries, US. yes. A actually, uh, AMSAT uh, names the satellites, but we, they have to be coordinated through the IARU, and uh, it has to actually meet a number of requirements, and that's the way they get an Oscar number. So for most folks, uh, it's, we say these acronyms, and uh, when you deal with the space agencies, pretty soon you're talking acronyms of acronyms. But uh, OSCAR is an acronym. That is a Orbital Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. So uh, the, That goes all the way back to the very first one, OSCAR 1. Project OSCARs, yes. Yep. And, uh, Do you know what frequency that was on? It was on uh, VHF. I know it had a Morse code signal that was HI. And I can tell you a great story about it because I held the ARRL engineering model at Centennial a few years ago. It was very, very cold in the uh, uh, convention hall. And I went in and plugged it on and had the receiver on. And the rate of the HI, the experiment on Oscar 1, was it changed rates of the CW code depending upon the temperature. Yeah. And it went from slow to fast in 10 minutes as it warmed up the electronics. So, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how slow it ever got. I've listened to recordings and, and read some of the history, and it was, you know, brr, 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 and they, they would slow it down. But as I was listening to it on the recording, um, since I knew what it was going to send, and it was mm. just HI, I could actually distinctly get it. Uh, it was 145.97 and then a couple more digits. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when no one had equipment that, <laughs> that could resolve those digits, so it didn't really matter, but it was just below the one. Yeah, and uh, with the Doppler with CW anyway, it's, yeah. uh, your, your, your pitch is going to change somewhat for yeah. that. So. And I think uh, uh, maybe 144.9 something. I was just below 145. Megahertz. So uh, yeah, the, look, had to look, that's, the that's, experiment that's, it still worked. That's uh, the important point. The league re, uh, restored the capacitors. That's what had failed over the years, and uh, and I believe it was Bob Allison did a great, great job restoring it. But uh, you know, this is this is what happens when you volunteer for AMSAT. Is I walked to the Centennial, and the league guys went here. Here's Oscar one. It's yours for the weekend. <laughs> So we all posed like Lance Jenner did with uh, the satellite under our arm, and uh, before we put it back in the case, <laughs> that sort of thing. But I got to play with uh, one of the models of Oscar One all weekend long, and I'm, I'm telling you, they, they redid the electronics, and that experiment still worked. So we could actually test your theory out, find out what the rates are on the engineering model. Yeah. Uh, go back to a question I was trying to remember to ask a while ago, your very first contact. Oh, how did that go? 
So uh, AO51 uh, was my first contact. And, and, and uh, that, that mode was what, uh, two meters, 70 centimeter probably? Yeah. And was yeah. it a transponder so, uh, sideband? Uh, no, it was actually an FM satellite. One of the FMs. Okay. So uh, uh, I had decided that before I made any satellite contacts, I was going to build a complete ground station. Um, this is where professional and, and the amateur sides <laughs> go up. Most amateurs go out with a with a handheld, uh, a handy talkie and an antenna. Well, no, 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 that's not how I do things. I have to build a, a big ground station, then I'll go work portable. Uh, so uh, I was trying to do that and had all my stuff ordered and had everything that I thought that I needed. Had my uh, FT-847 sitting there all, all programmed up and ready to go. Been listening a lot. I I've been listening a lot, and, uh, and it was just on my, uh, my vertical dual band antenna, and there was a pass, and I thought, well, what, what the heck, I'll, uh, I'll try. And I got on the air and threw my call sign out, and, and typically when you make a QSO with uh, the satellites, you use your call sign, you use your maiden head grid, but you only use the four letters of the main head grid. Well, I used all six. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how they, the other operators could tell I was a newbie. And, uh, and they laughed. But I got a contact back from uh, one of the guys uh, in the Bay Area. And he got me loud and clear. And I was so excited that this I jumped This is from up. Colorado? Uh, it was actually from California. Okay. In, in California. Okay, so, so I live in the Sierra Nevada at that time, and, and it was uh, from a guy in the Bay Area a whole hundred miles away. <laughs> Which is irrelevant. <laughs> could, yeah, he, he could have been you know, a thousand miles away. Well, he, he could have been out there over the Pacific somewhere, but uh, whales don't have handy talkies. So uh, to use one of Mark Hammond's old quotes, uh, there's not a lot of contacts that go on when the footprint's over the ocean. So uh, I, I was so excited, I jumped up. And I missed the next two guys trying to contact me because they knew it was a new guy and they could tell that the way I faded in and out that I was probably on a vertical antenna. So uh, I did get to meet uh, the guy that I made a contact with a few months later at one of the symposiums and uh, we exchanged QSL cards that way So uh, uh, and pictures, of course, uh, with the first contact. But did you have the presence of mind to record it? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I barely had the presence of mind to write down the call sign at that point. So, yeah, you, you do tend to get a little excited by this. So, so you go into your own personal orbit that is almost high enough to see the satellite in person. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's the fun of being successful. And I think any DXer can, can relate to this. When you get that far, far country that's that last uh, QSL card or contact that you need, you, that's a very, very exciting feeling. It's a feeling of accomplishment. All right, uh, and so uh, c condense the the story, but uh, to bring us up to the current day, what? How did you okay. progress through the you know, generations of equipment and capability? What, so what I, I still have my same old station and starting to operate portable stuff, and I think I've gone through about four handy talkies, and uh, I still have a, an elk antenna and a, uh, a aero antenna that I use, and I handhold those. I use an app on the phone, uh, uh, HamSat is the one that I particularly use, and I track the satellites that way, and I listen to the ISS as it comes down on the downlink passes, because uh, we don't tell you what the uplink passes are, because they interfere with the school contacts. And basically, I listen a lot, and I monitor it, and every now and then I'll throw my call sign out there and do a contact. So uh, I'm not somebody that has to operate all the time, but uh, it, it's fun, and I travel around quite a bit, so uh, my grid square is always changing. <laughs> now, are you a uh, satellite celebrity? When your call sign shows up, does everybody know who you are? Uh, I think nobody knows who I am, and that's the best <laughs> okay. part about it. I'm just, will, I'm, just, now. <laughs> I'm just another operator So at, at this point, but, uh, but we'll see. Uh, I, I did have one of the guys in, in Colorado that's known me for 20-some-odd for years there. He was teasing me, telling me I was a celebrity in Aspen now, so uh, I'm not sure... Uh, it, you know that and two hundred dollars would get me into the bar to buy a drink. So, <laughs> so you you started. Um, well, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see, you, you walk around the Hamfest a little bit and see. You know, <laughs> this has provided me a lot of celebrity. I can't walk through the Hamfest anymore without you know people saying how much they like the show. Um, so, you started on an FM satellite, mm -hmm. and of course, the other the other main way to do things is, uh, is the, the linear transponders. Yeah, which would be typically sideband or CW. Correct. Um, have you operated those? 
Uh, I have not operated those yet just because that uh, I'm in the midst of building another ground station uh, and I'm going to op try to operate all modes after I get the ground stations uh, redone. So uh, I had this great idea to put my, uh, my uh, 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 M-squared antennas up on the top of a 50-foot tower, and that was probably not the best thought that I ever had because uh, you're constantly messing with antennas and rotors, and you got to climb 50 feet up all the time. So. They, don't, they don't need to be up on towers for uh, No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you live and learn sometimes. Uh, you know, I, I was a, a big mountain rescue guy, so I had the climbing equipment and everything. So it was like, ah, let's put it up there. Okay. Uh, but thinking back, yeah, it's going on a shorter tower, and uh, I get that one translated over. And then at uh, my second house, I have a, a TS-2000X, uh, uh, which will just be uh, 10 feet off the deck, and, uh, and that will operate off the deck. But... Uh, of course, I'm waiting for the snow to get off the deck so I can refinish the deck before I put all the aluminum up. Yeah, I, I helped out with a uh, Sarah Cerex uh, contact even before Eric's mm -hmm. Cerex contact back in the early '90s. And, yep. uh, we, our club in Raleigh, used the services of a couple of the satellite guys. Yeah. And they both had their satellite antennas just sitting. Not they weren't on the ground, but they were on just on a, uh, a sunroof or something on the roof of a, a sunroom. And, uh, yeah, I have a nice all, portable pole, you know, yeah. that, uh, that they'll go up on 10 feet off the ground. Yeah, it's all, in, all you need. Um, I, I suppose you want to, a little bit of ground clutter clearance for working stuff down to the horizon, all the way to the horizon. Yeah, it depends on your horizon. I mean, uh, my one house where I'll have the portable set up, you know, portable is a, a relative term, you know, meaning that I can break it down in two or three days. Uh, sort of thing uh, and hold the center blocks and hold the, 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 the antenna mount down but um, I have a, a mountain behind me that's 30 degrees up so I know that 30 degrees to the west <laughs> I'm not going to work anything so uh, that's uh, generally knowing your area knowing what it is knowing where the trees are trees uh, you know trees do not give you gain that's a, a simple fact in life so uh, it's most like a 10 20 db pad so just uh, remember if you're pointing at the trees it's probably not going to work <laughs> all right how many satellites are in actual operation today by uh, amsat and then in amateur radio in general so uh right now we are up to um, what i would say uh if you call the oscar numbers we're up to 92. there's been 92 numbers issued not all of those are working, but there's probably a good dozen of those uh, that have numbers that are working or work in various modes. Uh, AMSAT has three operational satellites right now. They are all FM. It is uh, Alpha Oscar 85, uh, Alpha Oscar 91, and Alpha Oscar 92. Uh, 91 and 92 were launched within the past three months. It's uh, been the the fruition of a five-year program trying to get uh, the satellites back in space because uh, AO-51 died uh, quite a number of years ago, about six years ago, and uh, we were without an FM transponder up there. So we focused on the FM. Uh, we have one more satellite to go in the FM series, which is a FOX-1 Cliff. That satellite will be launched uh, sometime this summer, and I say that crossing my fingers <laughs> because the one date that does move is launch dates. And uh, uh, from that, uh, uh, that one will go up. Uh, the next one is uh, Fox 1E, and that will be a linear transponder. You lose the uh, the Fox designation once they're in orbit? Uh, yeah, you can... Uh, you can still call them Fox. We we know them because that's the series of satellites we worked on. Once it gets in orbit, we just call it by the Oscar number. Okay. Are there any of the linear transponders from other satellite groups that are that are on the air, or is everything FM now? Uh, there was a dearth of FM satellites. Uh, the only other satellite that was FM was uh, SO50. So we had AO7 and SO50 and AO85. And now we have two more. So there are five now. And that five helps trans, trans, trans five trans FM satellites. Okay. Uh, there's a number of ones that are transponders. And that uh, typically AMSAT UK has two. And uh, being an amateur radio guy, you got to love this. It is uh, AO73 and <laughs> AO88. <88, okay. laughs> and and they, were, they were really trying to get that launch window so they could get the 88 number. All right. So... Um, 
how, how is the, the, the relationship between the FM satellite enthusiasts and the sideband CW transponder enthusiasts? Is there a rivalry, dividing line, anything like that, or is it all good satellite? Uh, it's, think about it in, in this way, and this is why I, I try to, how I try to explain it. They're different modes. It's a different way of operating. If you're a CW operator, do you not like the voice guys? Or if you're a voice guy... That's, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Well, <laughs> listen to, to, to any chatter sometime, and you know there's, there's many, many opinions out there. But mostly, if you're an operator, it's what equipment do you have? If you have the equipment to be able to operate in that mode, then there's not a problem. If you don't have the equipment to be able to operate in that mode, then it's a uh, sort of a problem. So there was a little bit, I think, for the, the people that do the FM satellites, they did not have equipment that they could operate the linear birds. So if you do have the equipment where you can operate single sideband or you can operate CW, it's very easy to do, and that equipment probably operates FM as well. So it's, it's easy for you to operate those modes. There's not a lot of radios, however, that are dual band, and you can operate the, uh, the linear transponders all with one radio without a, a, great, a greater expense. So the, uh, what we found is people are doing transmits with one radio that does the single sideband, and then they're using things like SDRs to do the receive downs because that makes it more economical to operate on those modes. So you just have to find a way to operate on that particular mode, on that particular band, and it's actually quite rewarding for ham radio, I, I tend to think. Do you get lobbied by people for the next satellite? Oh, God, no. No, that never happens. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that, the, that that tends to happen. <laughs> so uh, anytime you do anything, uh, that becomes a feature of the next satellite. So every satellite has to have everything you've done the last time because that's what people, that, that particular person, like to operate on, and, uh, and you just try. So we have uh, uh, some folks are all about progressing the radio art, and that's fine, but when it comes to an FM sat, they, didn't wanna, they don't want to see that. So we had programs that they could work on, and it was called, uh, we call it Ascent. It's basically AMSAT Skunk Works. So we just, uh, and I'm going to talk about our next satellite now, which is Golf, which is a greater orbit, larger footprint. This is a 3U, so three times the size of a CubeSat, of a 1U CubeSat that the Fox systems have been. These are going to operate what we call 5 and dime, 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, software-defined transponder. So think about what a software-defined transponder is for a second. Whatever frequency you can program it into, if you have an output for that antenna, you can operate off of that mode. So that's one of the, the next series of satellites that we're talking about with Golf. That's one of the features that we're talking about with it. 3U, whole huge array of <laughs> energy. Well, huge from a 1U. So we've learned how to miniaturize. Now we're going to get a little bit bigger. Uh, <coughs> There's CubeSats going to the moon right now that, uh, that ESA just announced, the, the winners. They do not have any amateur packages on them, except that one of the winners of that uh, thing, uh, they're affiliated with Surrey Space. And uh, for our AMSAT UK guys, everybody knows that Surrey Space is pretty, very, very closely affiliated with AMSAT UK. So uh, I hope that... Uh, uh, they managed to get an amateur radio uh, package on that, and uh, I'll be teasing and needling my AMSAT UK uh, colleagues to get that done. Uh, I want to go into the, uh, the the idea of this software-defined um, radio up on the satellite. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've been hearing about is from Bob McGuire and the guys at Virginia Tech, yes. and, and the thing that they are working on building, which would be an all-digital, five and dime, five gigahertz, ten mm -hmm. gigahertz. Uh, thousand ten kilohertz channels of software defined communication yes all digital but yes to do anything that you can send through it i guess um well first of all how connected is amsat to that i know bob mcguire's an amsat guy uh so what amsat did uh, that is called phase 4b and uh, uh phase 4b is a spacecraft from millennium spacecraft that um, an agency that uh, shall not be named owns the spacecraft bus. It was going to be in Hio over the United States. 
And AMSAT did a feasibility study that uh, said, yes, we could put a five and dime transponder on it with a thousand different channels and we would build all the equipment and it met their power requirements. The Air Force... And it was going to be a, a geosynchronous. Yes, it'll be a, a geosynchronous. So the, Which is uh, kind of a holy grail. Uh, it's kind of a holy grail. So, so the satellite provider that, that was going to purchase this, the rest of the satellite, um, they're, they're trying to find out if they want to use that spacecraft frame, getting their funding and that sort of stuff. So we're kind of in a limbo. Yes, we can get, we've done feasibilities where we can get on a HEO, we can meet their power buses, but our ride sort of went away. And uh, in doing that, what happened was our ride went away. So now we're looking at, is that how we're going to proceed? Or do we need to go somewhere else? Do we need to find another ride? We have the technology to be able to do that. We just don't seem to have a satellite or a ride. Uh, or when we do find one, it seems to evaporate due to funding of some sort. Okay, so I hadn't heard about that. That has to have been a pretty big disappointment. Uh, it's not for sure that that ride has completely evaporated yet. We'll, we will make a, uh, a determination later this summer of uh, what we're going to do with that particular program. Uh, and, uh, and Virginia Tech is working very, very hard. Bob McGuire is working very hard to still make that program work. And uh, I still hope it comes to fruition. It gives us the ride that we've always uh, looked for. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to temper expectations that, uh, you know, it may, may not happen because there is a, a, a lot of other political stuff at work and cost of these satellites gets to be in excess of four to six million dollars. And when you look at that, um, for four to six million dollars, you can build a whole brand new spacecraft frame and fund something in your district if you're in the Senate. Okay. <laughs> So um, there, there was a, there's another geosynchronous satellite that has been planned, and I'm not sure what, what your status is, uh, for Asia and uh, Europe, the SALSAT. What's its status? Uh, SALSAT is supposed to launch, I think I saw on the boards, um, it will launch out of Kennedy on a SpaceX uh, sometime coming up this year. I'm not sure which quarter it was, but... Uh, uh, I was surprised to, to see it was going to launch out of uh, out of uh, Cape Canaveral down there on hmm. one of the SpaceX yeah. launches, but uh, that will be over the um, the Middle East, and that was uh, funded, I believe, by the Qatari yeah, uh, Middle East, not Asia. Right. Um, yeah, Qatar, and um, so it is. It is more of a sure thing. Uh, it's more of a sure thing. Uh, uh, Peter, the president of Amsat DL, came over to our symposium in Reno here this last year, gave a great presentation on it, and uh, they built the transponder for it. So it looks like that one's going to happen, and uh, uh, very excited for them. Glad they, they could, uh, that that's happening. And uh, we are working uh, through our policies and, uh, and presentations with uh, uh, the EAR, the uh, Export uh, Administration Regulations, through our Department of Commerce to be able to get partnerships back with our AMSAT partners overseas uh, to be able to do some projects like this, uh, be able to share uh, uh, information and components uh, where we're not restricted by, uh, by U.S. law, basically, right now. Yeah, what you're talking about are things that, um, I don't know if it the Patriot Act or where, where things happened, but it has it was, become much uh, more difficult to share technology because people are afraid that it could be used for, uh, for terrorism. Yeah, for terrorism, exactly. It was called ITAR, the uh, uh, International Treaty on Arms Reduction. It basically classified any satellite as a munition and uh, the, nothing the tar, could be the shared. The TAR part being a particularly appropriate acronym. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so ITAR, so that has, that was, um, shall we say, the program that ITAR was, was put into the Department of Commerce and the export uh, administrative regulations where they now manage uh, the program. And it, it gave a lot of relief to, um, to CubeSats and CubeSat uh, developers. But there's still some things in that that uh, you can't talk to people who are not U.S. citizens. So you need to have a policy. Who's a U.S. citizen? Who can work on this? Who can? So it's not just sending to? equipment across borders. It is just it's, literally talking. It's information. Information is power. Okay. 
and and we apparently know something that could give some bad guy an advantage, I suppose. Uh, there are certain lists you can go through the uh, the control list on on what is uh, uh, considered something that has to be licensed. And uh, some of those things are like star trackers and attitude determination and control elements. Uh, some of the things are frequencies and power levels that are operated at. And uh, some of those frequencies, uh, albeit not the power levels, are in the amateur spectrum. All right. Uh, the sale set, what, what modes or what bands is it going to be? Uh, I believe for? that's, uh, uh, it's either, I, I'd have to look again because I don't want to misspeak, but I believe it's uh, 2.4 uh, gigahertz and, um, and may have some five and dime capabilities as well. And, but it's, it's going to be analog. It'll be a that I, that I, I'd have to look. I don't want to okay. misspeak. And it has no footprint over um, the Americas except for the far little eastern corner of Brazil. I believe that's, that's correct. A, yes, yeah. uh, no footprint over North America or uh, or uh, almost all of South America. Yeah. But uh, I will point out. So part of my uh, my thing is being a, an evangelist is think about this: uh, how many HEO satellites would you need to be able to talk around the world on amateur radio? And don't just say how many, one, how many, what kind one of that has HF on it. <laughs> how many what kind? So how many... Oh, uh, highly elliptical orbit? Uh, very, very high orbit. You know, our, our one satellite that we have over, like we were talking about with, uh, with Phase 4A and Phase 4B satellites, how many would you need? I, it's around four or five. This was proven with... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, TDRS satellites. Uh, I was going to say, that's GPS. about what NASA does for sending stuff around the world yeah. for the space station. All the uh, tracking uh, uh, data relay systems. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly they've been, it. They've been doing that back since the Mercury program, I think. Uh, it's a little later than that, but yeah, it, it's uh, they've been doing that. So if we start building in to what we call the, the Phase 4 systems, the ability to communicate with other satellites and other bands, albeit, again, we start talking about software to find transponders, then we can start linking these satellites together. That's just, right now, that's pie in the sky because we don't even have a satellite that'll work, but that's where I want people to start thinking. Think about where we can advance the radio art, even in satellites, and what we're doing today. So you're going to do with satellites what repeaters started doing back in the 1960s. Why not? <laughs> and uh, which, 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 by which I mean RF linking from one to the other. So what about a repeater on the lunar surface? What about a repeater at the uh, Lagrange points? What about repeaters? The that what are, points? <laughs> the Lagrange points. The Lagrange points. What are they? They are, are points in the orbit where do they do station keeping. So one of the processes that we're looking at for the next 10 years is we're asked to give a, uh, a proposal on a, uh, a program called Deep Space Gateway. So Deep Space Gateway is like what the International Space Station is now, except it's in the, uh, the point where the gravity between the moon and the Earth is fairly equalized. So it stays there without too much station keeping doesn't need fuel or propellant or that sort of thing. And this is a way station for astronauts on the way to the moon. And that would follow, evidently, the moon's orbit. It would follow the moon's orbit, and uh, and it is at that point. So you just got to get to that point. You just got to get away from Earth's gravity, and then you just got to get a little boost to the moon to get have the moon's gravity take over. So they're talking about putting a, a, a manned station there, and they wanted to know what experiments would go on it. So, of course, we say, well, an amateur radio on the Deep Space Gateway would work much like an ARIS program. So they're calling for ideas, and we're throwing those ideas out there. And at the same time, uh, our folks from uh, uh, Europe, AMSAT DL and AMSAT UK, are throwing ideas out there like, hey, how about a repeater on the lunar surface? So why not? Why not? What's your path loss? And you start, you start combining, oh yeah, we got a repeater on the lunar surface, but we have to use EME techniques to be able to communicate with it. So there is a lot of digital modes you can do with these types of things. A lot of things we do now terrestrially here on Earth, but as you start applying these things to space, it becomes an exercise in weak signal work. 
All right, so uh, circling back to the uh, the idea of <laughs> what, the uh, what was my first contact again? Uh, no, no, <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward from that a little bit. Okay, but, but go, going back to the software defined radio because I I kind of slipped into the uh, the thing that, that Bob McGuire and the Virginia Tech guys were yeah. building. But you've got a next phase satellite coming up that you're gonna do as an SDR that will be a uh, an orbiting a Leo orbiting satellite. Yeah. So uh, what we have right now is the the Golf program greater orbit, larger footprint. So uh, typically, much like how uh, Apollo went to the moon, they tested everything out in the Earth's orbit before they actually sent spacecraft to the moon. Well, we're doing that to try to get a CubeSat. So we have other programs, not just looking at other satellite programs. The programs we're developing with Fox, with Golf, is to learn how to build CubeSats. So our next is a 3U, then maybe a 6U CubeSat. We have to see what the power buses give us from uh, the solar panels we're getting. But this gives us five and dime capability, uh, five gig, 10 gig, a lot of bandwidth for data, a lot of digital modes, a lot of the ability to where we have um, a satellite in orbit over the U.S. that people can use, much like the Phase 4s that Bob McGuire was talking about with the digital channels. The ability to work with FEMA, which uh, both the, the ARRL and uh, the FEMA folks want and would have been critical during, uh, during the hurricanes down there in Puerto Rico if we would have had that, had that capability. So we want to put a satellite out there but do we wait for a ride to come along on a spacecraft or can we do this on our own? And that is sort of advancing the radio art that we're looking at doing. So golf. Launch it on your own? We're not gonna launch it on our okay. own. So you still need a ride of a spacecraft. So it's still gonna need a ride to LEO, which is much uh, more economical than paying for a ride all the way to HEO. So we build a CubeSat series that we can test things out, things that we can hold the spacecraft still the ADAC, the Attitude, Determination, and Control. So this has this ability to station keep, and we can test that out in LEO by monitoring it in LEO. We can put the software to find transponder on it, so we can test that out in orbit, see how radiation affects that, in an orbit that's higher than a normal LEO. So what we're looking at for our golf programs is being able to get orbits that are twice like a 600 kilometer orbit, more of like the old AO 40 days orbits where they're kind of a millennium orbit, but uh, upwards of you know 1500 kilometers, something of that range. A what kind of orbit? Uh, <coughs> I, my, I, you have to understand, English is not my strong suit. So <laughs> a, uh, it's a Russian orbit that is a highly elliptical orbit uh, up into um, uh, uh, a path that is uh, 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 sort of very, very high apogee, so it stays over its path longer, so you can operate it longer, and then it has a very quick perigee as it comes back around the Earth. Okay, and there have been some, a bunch of satellites that did that. There's a lot of satellites that have done that, and we're looking at doing that in sort of a LEO version, so uh, you know, think around 1,500 kilometers to be able to do something like that and do testing with it. It's still a LEO satellite because it's not that far away from the Earth, but uh, it is a longer duration satellite. And we'll use that as a test bed. And after you're able to do something like that, do all your testing, do your station keeping, get your radios working, get your power buses working, what's the, the next step? Well, it's called strap an engine on it and go. So what's happened now is there's been a lot of development on what's called RCM reaction control modules. These reaction control modules are actually building them to take one U up and once they get the thrust fa uh, uh, factors worked out where we can com uh, propel that mass to a higher orbit, that's our next step. That's our next project and that gives you basically station keeping as well until you run out of <laughs> propellant. Which has been the deal for every satellite. That that's always that, that's uh, that's satellites way back. You know, satellite things run out of propellant. It uh, doesn't doesn't last very long. Yeah. So uh, help me with my my non-existent orbital mechanics. <laughs> um, the typical orbit for low Earth satellites is how far? And you're going to talk kilometers. And I don't. You know, I'm, so I'm an American. Uh, 
Well, it's time to get a conversion factor, I guess, is, is the way to go. 1.6, right? Or 0.6 so, or something? Yeah, point, uh, 1.6, I believe, is, is what the factor is. So uh, the uh, kilometers, the, the way I remember it is 88 kilometers is 55 miles an hour. That's the way I remember <laughs> it. So uh, uh, the ISS is about at 300 kilometers. So the reason the ISS is at 300 kilometers is because that is below almost 99% of the radiation from the Van Allen radiation belts. And that's why when the, the <coughs> craft come up to resupply the ISS, they have a little extra fuel so they can boost it back up into the orbits, and that's why your ISS orbital elements always change. So the space station is, it, its orbit, because of where it is, is going to constantly degrade it will constantly it gets degrade. A little kick. Yeah, I call it the K factor, which is drag uh, in all your orbital elements. Uh, there is not a, enough up there to take a deep breath, but there's not enough up there to take take a deep breath. But the the atmosphere of the Earth expands all the time. It's modeled uh, where uh, you run into particles and pieces uh, of you know tiny microscopic stuff. But it does have a drag effect. It does have mass. It will spin down. Uh, Skylab came down. The ISS will come down one day the same way. Uh, LEO satellites, that is how they uh, come down. That is their deorbit plan. Is eventually the drag will get a hold of them. It'll they'll, they'll deorbit. That's how they that's how and they burn up because they're small. So is the well booster is probably the wrong word, but it, whatever a rocket puts it. Gives it a little kick and a little bit higher again. Is that engine on the ISS or is it on? It's usually the uh, engines on the resupply craft. Okay, so they 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 are connected. So when they come up and dock, nice and strong. Yeah, when they come up and dock to the ISS, they give them a little boost on it. So that that's how they readjust the altitude. And you have to recalculate your orbital elements because of that. So uh, if anybody's listening to the ISS. Uh, the packet system, I believe, is currently down as of this date. Uh, they're trying to working hard to try to troubleshoot that, uh, but they're also working hard on on Eris and the ISS to get a new multi-voltage power supply up. Uh, and a uh, Kenwood graciously donated a bunch of uh, uh, D710s and get those up there, and we uh, program them. Uh, so that if you hit the reset button on the Kenwoods, it defaults to all of these uh, frequencies that we programmed in for Eris. So it doesn't re uh, uh, go to the factory defaults anymore. It goes to the Eris defaults. So uh, they donated uh, <laughs> all of those radios. We ha we're doing testing on those, uh, and we hope to fly those uh, sometime uh, within this year. Yeah, that, that, that reset thing, that's a lesson learned, I'm thinking, right? So lesson learned, yes. Okay, and the testing is everything that goes up there gets thorough testing, all kinds of testing. So I think the, the best way to explain the testing, and uh, folks here in Florida at, at Kennedy will certainly understand this, is the only time you fly anything on a manned mission is when the weight of the paperwork ex uh, exceeds <laughs> the weight of the object by at least 10 times. <laughs> okay, I got that. <laughs> um... We're, finally, my brain is kind of running out of things here. Uh, All right, so we were talking about golf. So that's the one oh, thing yeah. that, that I wanted to, to mention. So we do have the yeah. software-defined transponder on golf. So what can, what can you make it do, at, or is it anything, and can you send up instructions to make it do something else once it's in orbit? Uh, well, you can point it. That's the interesting thing, is you can point this thing where you want it for your attitude, determination, and control. And it will station keep. And it does it without propellant. So that's a key thing that we're trying to test and experiment with because we've never done that before as, as AMSAT guys. So that's new to us. We want to learn how to do that. We also want to play with the transponder, see what bands we can operate on effectively, what the Doppler is like at 5 and 10 uh, gigahertz in low orbits and in uh, elliptical orbits. So we can play with that somewhat. And, uh, and then we can put radiation experiments on this because these are going to go higher. You asked also well, what, yeah, how, how, what, what was the normal satellite orbit. So what, what determines what, what uh, an orbit is going to be? I mean, the launch, the well, launch vehicle. It, how do you decide what you want your orbit to be and then set up the launch to get there? You are given choices and you choose one. <laughs> that is, uh, so the way of getting launches is with uh, the ALANA, the CSLI agreements. You're, giving, uh, you're given orbits that 
here's what you can choose from. You don't know what kind of spacecraft is going to launch it, uh, and you make that choice. Okay. The other well, choice back, is to, to pay to, for a ride. Okay, let's go back to Spacecraft 101. And assuming that it was your craft and you could build as big a rocket as you wanted, you can go anywhere you want, didn't have to ask anybody, what orbits are, are feasible? Is any elevation orbit a feasible orbit? Uh, with a big enough rocket motor, yeah, any elevation is feasible. Yeah, so, because I mean, so, the, the geos are at twenty-two thousand miles. Yeah, they're at twenty-two thousand so. miles. That is that is where your geo orbits are. So typically, how these things go is to stay in orbit, you need to go about seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. So I won't put that in kilometers for you. <laughs> so that's what it takes, but that's what it takes to maintain that orbit so you've got to get up to that speed then the next part is how much propellant and thrust you have to be able to get that mass and that determines your orbit so typically what we see is with leo orbits you have 300 with the iss about 600 kilometers is five to six hundred kilometers is normal for what we call uh, sso sun synchronous orbits or polar orbits so 600 about for sun synchronous 500 for about polar orbits it's all the direction that the spacecraft goes when it launches and of course you want to try to launch with the spin of the earth so and not against it so uh, that uh, you get going faster and you don't have to try to make up that speed uh, later with propellant yeah all that stuff gives me a headache <laughs> um, so uh, and I, it's VHF the usual things apply. The far the, the higher you go, the farther you can talk. Same deal with higher the higher you go, farther you can talk. The larger footprint you have. So you you think about it um, as uh, when you're you're on the the local repeater. How far can you go? Well, if there's a mountaintop, you can go to the other side of the mountain. But is that 30 mile line of sight is typically what we're uh, left with. So now with a satellite in orbit, what we have is a footprint, depending upon the height of the orbit, that is almost the width of the United States. So we yeah. have guys who are actually trying to set distance records through satellites because they're trying to operate stations that are minus a few degrees below the satellite because radio signals tend to skip a little bit sometimes and they're uh, being able to, we have guys setting records that are actually beyond the theoretical limit <laughs> of what they calculate. So there's another aspect of satellite operation is you want to set a record, do something that uh, should be impossible. So, so when your elevation program is saying that the satellite is at minus one, minus two. And you're still talking to a guy <laughs> whose QHD is minus one or minus two, it still works. Yeah. Um, so the the uh, the Gulf, the, the HEO, Am I putting those things t together correctly? So uh, what we call HEO in the AMSAT world is highly elliptical orbit. Okay. What we call GEO is geostationary. All right. So I, a highly elliptical orbit is, is one that goes way up. It's, it's always moving, but it appears to slow down just because it... At, at the very high at the very high orbit. at the apogee yeah. it slows down so mm -hmm. let's see if i can get this right on your screen here well we'll use this yeah uh, there we go okay so here is a circular orbit you can see that it, it goes around see if i can do that right with yeah. the camera so this is an elliptical orbit it goes up like this and down like this up like this and down like this so if you're operating here you have a longer time that the satellite is overhead. Now your orbits that are out here, as this is turning, what you get is it turns with the rotation of the Earth, so it's like it stays over a same uh, same location. That's the geostationary, and that's why they're out at 22,000 miles. Yeah, that's the point where their orbit is the same. Equals the rotation hour, of the 24 Earth. 24-hour orbit, yes. approximately. And, and, it, and it's in orbit, it is moving, but to us uh, as a ground observer, it looks like it's staying still. Okay. Now, can orbits be set anywhere between those? Um, uh, they can, but uh, nobody typically ever does. Uh, nobody ever does. There, there's certain orbits that work well. Uh, the Iridium satellites are all in low, low orbits. There's uh, MEO orbits. Um, not a lot of use for MEO orbits other than scientific packages because there's station keeping you, you want to try to do with them. Uh, there's a lot of radiation in the Van Allen radiation belts in uh, medium Earth orbits, 
And to get up to geo, you've gone beyond a lot of that radiation that's around the Earth with the Van Allen radiation uh, belts, but you still have to pass through it. And uh, what you find is that's why things are so expensive to get to the geo orbits, is the, you've got to do a lot of uh, shielding. They got to encase your satellite in lead. Uh, well, <laughs> lead is uh, you know launching a brick is hard. <laughs> so uh, we try to uh, use the much lighter materials that we've found in the past that that shield things. Um, and we did do some shielding on the Fox series. There'll be a lot more shielding on the Golf series, and that's one of the reasons that we're experimenting with the, uh, the greater orbit, larger footprint idea with golf in LEO is we can get up into some of these radiation effects and do testing. That way we don't spend a lot of money that, to build a satellite that gets up to, uh, to GEO and doesn't work. Okay, so the golf satellites will be highly elliptical. You're yes. Not, you're not talking about putting them at 3,000 miles just to sit there. Like I said, there'll be elliptical orbits that go up uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 kilometers. Okay, and does that go up into the radiation belt? Yes. So it, pretty much anything over, uh, we have uh, lower radiations, uh, even with the Fox series in LEO, that are at about 600 kilometers, five, 600 kilometers. When we start doubling that to get up to you know, 1,200, 1,500 kilometers, that sort of distance, you're getting into more of the radi radiation belts and you need to have the effects. In fact, one of the experiments that we have on, on FOX is a, an experiment uh, that was done. Uh, what they look for is they call them single event upsets. They're running a, a subroutine on a chipset program and they're comparing that with the chipset running on the Earth, same program, same types of chips, and they're looking for different flips of bits, single event upsets, so they can rate the chip for space rating. <laughs> and that's on one of our satellites. Yeah. And now, the problem there is, uh, as I understand it, uh, gamma, gamma rays, a little particle, will accidentally, or well, it's not on purpose, but it will, yeah, they, it, it will hit your chip and it flies through the, the chips. It's small enough to go through the areas of all the silicon you know, atoms, and uh, it, it will change it, the bits. <laughs> and is that permanent change, or is that a... Well, it, it flips it, so what happens is you get an error. And when you get an error, if it's in a processor, it could cause the processor to reset. So every time you get an error, that means you basically your, your spacecraft computer is rebooting. So you want to be able to determine with that chipset how many errors are getting uh, done in the radiation, and you do that with a modeling with percentage. So it's basically a way of rating the chip to see if it's usable in space. Okay, so to summarize a bit and to see if how, how I'm going to do on the quiz, you're, you're <laughs> yes, planning. There'll be a test on this later. You're, you're planning a new satellite. It'll be software defined. It will have its own little rocket engine on it. No, not yet. So that's our that's our eventual goal. So the Golf Series, we have what's the first kickoff of the Golf Series that we announced. It's called Golf T. You know, the Golf T. Yeah, you, you, you can't use golf without have without setting it up on a T. It will have a attitude determination and control. It will have the software defined transponder on it, and it will have a radiation experiment on it. It will have fold-out solar panels in some fashion and be 3U in size. And uh, that is, uh, uh, we're hoping to see uh, <clears throat> what sort of a launch, if we're successful in applying for this, we should know more on that uh, by mid towards the end of September, or uh, that, February, I'm That sorry. would be a, a standard low Earth orbit? Yes, it'll be a low Earth orbit where we'll, we'll be able to do testing. Okay. And... But your long-time plan, a long-term plan, is to strap a, a motor on it. Our longer-term plan is to find someone who wants to test a reaction <laughs> control module, and uh, we will find uh, a, a way to try to get that launched. Okay, uh, what's a reaction control module? So a, uh, a reaction control module is a little, uh, I hate to use the word bomb-proof, but uh, <laughs> very, very uh rigid sort of containing device of propellant and typically it is using a uh, an inert gas and the inert gas has a little thruster engine on the back of it and it pulses out very very high pressure gas uh, to move the spacecraft okay 
and there's a few companies that have made it. Uh, I know Air Force Research Labs has looked into it. Vaco is a company that's made it. But right now, I've seen them built up to quarter U, half U, one U size reaction control modules. So calling that a rocket is not. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a rocket. It's a reaction control module. Our, our, okay. All right, I got. I was going to try to, to get. <laughs> Get get the letters of rocket into that, but the, the R is the where it stops working. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the so you take a, a standard ride up to a, a, a ordinary orbit, mm -hmm. and then that pushes you higher. How how much higher? Uh, that all depends upon what the propellant is and how many U it takes up, what the reaction control module is, and what the mass of your satellite is. So that's a variable. What, what would you like? Uh, we would like HEO, uh, you know, we, HEO high uh, elliptical Earth orbit all the way to, to GEO. That's what I would like. And I'm speaking as that as Joe, not president of AMSAT. I'd like to see something get to, to uh, uh, geostationary orbit. Okay. And, uh, but, but in between, it's still all the highly, is something a lot easier to do as highly elliptical than just getting up to that 1,000, 2,000 mile range? Because that would cover what most of the. Most of the LEO range, yeah. LEO generally goes up to, I think it's about 3,000 kilometers is what it goes up to. So we wanted to experiment in low Earth orbit and to find a path to GEO. The, um, I, I guess to, to say what is the mantra for amateur radio satellites is we've always been trying to find a path to HEO and beyond. And it's not only keeping amateur radio in space, it is finding that way to advance the radio art, and that's the, the next sort of step that I think we need to go. And so what it looks like is you're saying, uh, so if you guys aren't going to give us a ride to GEO, we are going we'll to build, build our own. <laughs> and that, if you think about AMSAT, that's what we did before with spacecraft that were much, much larger. And... We had uh, some, uh, what do we call, uh, a few of them, uh, when we tested them, they were uh, sub-oceanic orbits. Um, we had a one that uh, ended up in the drink. Uh, we had uh, issues with another one uh, that didn't perform. I just perform. got the sub-oceanic. <laughs> we had issues with another one that uh, did not perform nominally, <laughs> which, which meant uh, uh, there was a problem with it, and uh, we did gain some use back for it, but... Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, not our finest hour, shall we say, in that one. Uh, we've recovered from those. We're trying to build satellites more and more and more. We're trying to keep the original AMSAT idea of keeping amateur radio in space and to keep advancing the radio art, which means we keep going further and further and further than where we tried to go the last time. At what point in your career... The satellite career, and now we're going back to that first contact again. Did you join AMSAT? Um, pretty much uh, probably about a few months before the satellite contact. Um, I, I try to, to, I don't jump into things uh, usually if I don't think that, that I can handle them. Uh, you know, because uh, one of the things that, that I did with the education things is I would go out and I would tell kids, it's like, try not to say no. Well, there's some caveats with that. When you don't say no, you're saying yes, but try to know what you're saying yes to. And, and try to, uh, to think, what am I going to learn from this? How is this going to affect it? Because if you can answer the question, well, what I'm going to learn from this is I never want to do that again, <laughs> then, well, that may be a time to say no. <laughs> but I, I've, I think in my own personal career, in my own life, by the the things that I say it yes to, even though I wasn't sure as how I could accomplish it and how I could get to that, those were the things that were the most fun. Those were the things that were the most challenging that I learned the most from. And uh, and sometimes if you say yes uh, to that in your career, you know, starting out in, in high school and in junior high and that sort of things, well, say I my term is say yes to science. Science teaches you how the world works. It teaches you how space works if you let it. It teaches you how biology. It teaches you how amateur radio works. So if you learn amateur radio, you learn electronics, what are you really learning? Well, you're learning physics. And you have that step on a lot of people that don't take the time to learn that physics. So expand yourself and, and learn that. And, uh, and that's really where I try to tell folks to go with, with radio and, and with learning. So. 
in getting involved with satellites is sort of part of that. It was part of amateur radio that I didn't understand very well and I wanted to. And um, as part of that, I got to meet uh, a lot of, uh, of, the, of different astronauts. I've got to uh, do Eris contacts and talk with astronauts on the, on the space station. And I've got to see kids uh, inspired by doing that. It's uh, truly a once in a lifetime event for them. And uh, working with the programs, you know, I, I sort of do that uh, off hat. And I get to meet great folks from all over the world. That's, uh, that's kind of a side bit that I haven't, didn't think that would happen. But uh, uh, I've got to meet the guys from Germany, got to meet the guys from the UK, all the satellite enthusiasts. Um, it's, a, it's a neat, neat group that, uh, that has a lot of fun. And one of those deals where you put in a little, get back a lot. Yeah, you get back more than uh, than than try. And, and how that happened was, I said yes. That's all that happened was I, I decided, yeah, I would go do that, and uh, and it's it's been a lot of fun. Pitch time, <laughs> pitch time. So I got two pitches for you. Actually, I got three pitches for you. Ampsat.org. Go be a member. That's that's the the thing we get. It's like forty four bucks a year. Go be a member. We're a nonprofit. And uh, you can go to ampsat.org. We have a store. There's a getting started guide on the store if you're interested in the satellites. I think we get a $20 donation for it. Or if you come to Hamcation, we have a few on the table over there. You can uh, get yours right away. We also have a special offer going on right now because of the new satellites. But wait, there's more. There's more, yes, there's more. This is the evangelist part, yeah. So uh, we have AO91 and 92. We have a special going on where if you join AMSAT, you get to download a PDF copy of the Getting Started Guide. And uh, then we have two fundraisers. One is for golf, uh, greater or orbit, larger footprint. We had a President's Tea Challenge, a uh, $15,000 matching fund that uh, ends next week and of course we'll have more fundraisers for golf as the program uh, develops and ARIS the amateur radio on the International Space Station also needs to raise funds to be able to launch that equipment up to the ISS so uh, just like anything else in amateur radio there's all different aspects that uh, you can play with and and uh, have neat interactions with uh, folks from all over the world, and everybody wants your money. <laughs> well, of course, we 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 want your money, but we're a nonprofit, so it is tax deductible. <laughs> ah, this year, anyway. This year, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Uh, you got some events coming up. Yeah, uh, we have uh, uh, an interesting event here. We're talking every year. We have a AMSAT uh, Space Symposium and General uh, Annual General Meeting, and uh, that is going to occur in the southeast United States this year, probably sometimes towards the end of October, beginning of November time. Uh, it will be in southeast U.S. and uh, it will uh, be near a, uh, a, a NASA space flight center. I can't say which one right now, uh, but not Kennedy. <laughs> and uh, we also, uh, so that look for that this fall. Come out and join us. Uh, we have one, uh, what, space flight center? Yeah. Well, there's a few. I mean, there's Langley, there's uh, what Huntsville or Marshall. Uh, there's. Uh, does that mean they launch from there, or they? That's where NASA. From that's there? where NASA is. Where there's Ames Research out in okay. in that sort. So NASA centers. So okay. they don't launch space flight centers where they launch from. Though. So that's the space center. It is Kennedy. They only launch okay. from two places in the U.S. right now, and that's Vandenberg and Kennedy. And uh, actually, Wallops does uh, some lower level launches. So, so does having the symposium near a space flight center? indicate perhaps uh, space center i think i misspoke okay. space center does that indicate perhaps you like a tour or something might happen yes <laughs> <laughs> okay that's why that's a good reason for being close good reason for being near one of those okay, uh, we, so we try to have uh tours uh, after the symposium uh on uh, a banquet that sort of thing after the symposiums and that sort of thing how that, many folks uh, show up at those usually it's about 100 150 but uh, if you're in the area come on down and see us uh We'll make more room. All right. So we don't know quite where it's going to be or, or even it'll, when it'll it's be going to be in the, the fall uh, in the southeast. It'll be in the fall in the southeast, and it'll either be the uh, the second weekend before the end of October or probably the first weekend in November. It's all going to depend upon where we get hotel committals. Okay. You get a big uh, forum in Dayton. We're going to have a big forum at uh, Dayton, the AMSAT Forum. Uh, it's, uh, I think it goes about an hour and a half. Uh, we have about half a dozen presentations. It's about as long as this show has been. I can talk for a long time, but I'll have help there. <laughs> you, you, well, when we were talking before we started the show, uh, 
You said, what, what do you want, like 10, 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're hams. We like to talk. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I got a forum at Dayton, and uh, you um, alternate on a banquet with Tapper. Is this the AMSAT year for the banquet uh, this Saturday night? This is the uh, AMSAT year for the speaker, for the, uh, the AMSAT Tapper banquet. And uh, we uh, uh, have not got a commitment out of the speaker that we want yet, but uh, I believe it'll be uh, a speaker that will interest both the AMSAT and Tapper folks and uh, maybe draw a few hams over uh, from uh, another banquet or something of that nature. <laughs> is that, that's Friday night? Uh, it is uh, typically Saturday night, Saturday. I believe. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, all that information for Hamvention will be on our website. Uh, we've got a, a great guy, Phil Smith, helping out this year. He's our new coordinator. And uh, we had our first meeting yesterday where we were talking about uh, uh, what we're going to do at, uh, at Xenia this year. And uh, we should be in the same location. Uh, if you haven't come out to uh, Hamvention since it was in Hera, uh, it is a different venue. And... Uh, it is much improved. There's no mud in the AMSAT booth. There is no mud in the AMSAT booth. Um, uh, I equate this. When you come to Dayton, you are coming to the Mecca of the ham radio world. So when you're in Mecca, you have to do a lap around the Kabbalah. <laughs> well, in Hera Arena, that was the ice hockey rink. You did a lap around the ice hockey rink. Uh, I think the Kabbalah at Xenia Fairgrounds is a lap around the flea market. Yeah, and if you do that, and then there come over to the mud. booth, then come over to the booth, <laughs> then there'll be mud at the booth. Yes. So just you know, wipe, wipe your feet before you. And, get there. And it's a, a guarantee if you uh, one day at Hamvention it will rain. <laughs> um, yeah, or maybe all. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm, one I'm, day. I'm, I'm looking forward to a better Hamvention this year. Um, so I mean, we're at Orlando. Yep. And uh, this is a. Uh, I mean, it, it's the number two. And so the number, a, the, a pretty this big is gap, the, uh, but it's it's closing. It's closing, yeah. Uh, that's one of the reasons I came down to uh, Hamcation this year. It's a, a great fundraiser for AMSAT when we come down, and I wanted to support Hamcation and uh, and be down in Florida. And I'm uh, also going to try to support a couple of other events here this year. One is CPAC up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, probably the uh, Nevada convention since uh, I live in Nevada I probably have to go to that one just uh, out of things and they contacted me the other day and uh, I may end up down in Albuquerque at the Rocky Mountain uh, ARRL convention uh, we're trying to put on forums there how to learn how to use satellites try to get the interest back up in amateur satellite use which is not education it is operation it's operational <laughs> but think about it to be a good operator you got to educate yourself is, yeah uh, and I was going to ask about um, forums at local or smaller venues ham fests club meetings things like that what uh, what are the options for those so what we're, uh, we're looking at this year is uh, starting a program where we can actually Skype into your uh, AMSAT club and, uh, uh, or in, uh, into the club, in, into your radio your club, club your meeting. amateur <laughs> club meeting. Sorry there. Uh, anything that starts with an A is automatically AMSAT to me. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll, we'll Skype into your amateur radio club and have, you know, 15, 20 minutes, whatever a small presentation is uh, that we can present to your club. And then we can uh, ask questions back and forth. We're still working on getting that development, but I've had a lot of interest in, in doing something like that. Ham Radio Club, typically vice presidents. Don't ever be the vice president. I mean, you, it makes you pick all, all the uh, all the meetings. I mean, they're they're just dying for good program material, so uh, that they're going to want that. Yep, and uh, hopefully they'll see what a poor speaker I am, and they won't want me. So we, we made ninety minutes here. In that ninety minutes, is there anything we left out? Uh, probably a, a mil lot. Yeah. A million things we, we left have. We have fifty years of amps had to go over. I think yeah. we covered a week. Is there so, any, anything you're desperate to add? Uh, mostly, it's the fundraising. If, if you want amateur radio in space, it costs real dollars, and uh, we need membership. We need uh, contributions to be able to make that happen. So uh, give what you can. All right. It is um, Joe Spear. Spear? Spire? Spire. 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 Hey, you. <laughs> <laughs> K6WAO president of AMSAT. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. And uh, let's see. Let me push up. Speaking of, of uh, looking for money, there's, uh, there's me. Uh, Ham Radio Now is brought to you by you. As I discovered uh, on the, on this placards that I put up on the table, uh, I had written some time ago, it is uh, free to make. It is not. No, it's free to watch. <laughs>
I got that like 100, 180 degrees wrong. Free to watch, not free to make. HamRadioNow.tv is the place to go if you're uh, interested in helping us out. And uh, let's see, I believe that would be me, Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Uh, sorry, David Goldenberg is not here. I might be able to get him on Skype before the weekend is out. We will find out. Uh, still no end titles to stick you with, so it just goes to black. Over and out. <laughs>